Great. Awesome. Where are you located? Uh, I'm in Oakland, California, so the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, great. Well, I'm Zaina. This is um, my uh, studio here is Synergy Plus in San Rafael, California. Awesome. And um, I'll introduce everybody to you just in t for, for speed, unless anybody wants to introduce themselves. <laughs> we have um, Genevieve uh, and Allegra, both in orange, and Kim. Um, and then Frida down at the bottom, who's not visual right now. All of them work here at Synergy. Um, the three first are Pilates instructors, and Frida is a physical therapist. And then um, Allison Gregory up in the corners in Florida. And she um, trained with us, with me, how long ago, Allison? I forgot, years ago. And <laughs> moved to Florida and opened her own studio there. So, um, and then we get people in from, we have a few other people that pop in from Oakland. And so we're, we're really happy to have, have you. Awesome. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Um, so we were going to address the neck and head positioning, right? Especially with upper ab curl. Yes. Okay. So um, I'll start us off and then basically I'll open the floor and have you guys um, kick in with whatever else you had to offer. Um, with the neck and head positioning, it's always a challenge to figure out. We, we did a couple modules ago, we did the osteoporosis one, and we were talking about not rolling the head up at all for people with osteoporosis, um, and talking about how you can still engage those obliques and the rib cage in that case. And so for now, um, we're talking about how do we get somebody to have the right head position, how to not strain, um, and then how to actually have them be able to lift the head without straining as well. And I think it's a really staged process. So I'll take you through a few things that I do and then again, open the floor. So um, why don't you, if you wanna do it with me, I'll explain what I'm doing as we go or you can just watch, it's totally up to you. And I'm gonna start, I usually start people out laying on their back to um, try and unwind everything really. So taking a breath in and then exhaling, just landing down. And then when it comes to the head and neck, there's a really interesting connection. If you think about it in cervical area as being just that extension of the spine, and that's usually what I really encourage is for people to think about that connection to the rest of their spine. And if we go that route, then if I want to release the upper quadrant, I can actually use my lower spine to do it. And that's usually where I start people, trying to relax here on the floor, and then exhaling, letting the belly drop in naturally, and then adding a little bit of integrity to it. And then pelvic floor lifting, and then rolling into that flat back position. And then you'll inhale back to neutral. So now I'm going to actually increase the amount of motion intentionally in order to try and release the head and neck. So I would take that same breath in, exhaling, belly drops, pelvic floor lifting, and then allow that rocking to happen. And as, it, as I rock the tail up, I allow my, it to affect my upper quadrant. So I allow that chin to drop, and then inhale, unrolling, the chin releases upward a little bit. So it's really subtle and you don't have to worry about all the details of the coccyx curl. If, if your goal is just releasing this upper, you can have them just rock the pelvis, let the head follow and release. So if you can tune into that, it's a great way to get people to just let go of this upper quadrant before they begin anything else. We, I use this a lot with people who have thoracic outlet syndrome too just to release and relax that upper quadrant. So you can actually exaggerate a little bit the extension part as well to feel what it does to your chin and upper, right? And then let it release and tuck, right? So we'd start there just to get them to turn it off as much as possible. And then if I was gonna start training for upper ab curl, there's a number of ways to do it. I usually try and have them just go into it with a supported head first and understand what that position is. So when I tell people to support their head, 
I tell them to interlace their fingers behind their neck and run their thumbs down the sides of the neck. So I'm really bracing the neck. So I'll take the hands back. I'll hug, I'll sit up so you can see. But I'll interlace the fingers, I'll hug the neck itself and run the fingers either down the sides or just down the back of the neck. And I'm squeezing inward and pulling long. So I've essentially braced the neck entirely. And then my goal would be to keep that position when I'm down here and then increase the length of the neck as I go. So I try and get people to think about going long first, so pulling the head off your shoulders and holding it there, supporting it with a tiny bit of a chin tuck and then activating the rib cage. So rib cage connecting to bring the head up. My head doesn't actually lift and then back down. So when I learned this exercise, we called it upper ab curl, but lately more people have been calling it trunk lift or chest lift. And I think that that's really more accurate because the rib cage is what's squeezing to get the trunk to follow, the head to follow, and then releasing. So my head is a result of the rib cage motion or the spinal motion. My head doesn't actually lift itself. So that's why hands behind the neck supporting is a really great way to strengthen somebody because the head comes along but the ribs are doing the work. So that's usually where I would start them with that really nice braced position. And then you could take that right into any leg position that you felt comfortable with, right? progressing it, making it more and more difficult, but keeping that support so that we're starting to strengthen. The goal would be to strengthen the rib cage area in order to get that head to follow along. Um, so progressing from there, a couple ways to do that too. For me, it's really important that the lats connect. So if I were to take the arms, right, for hundreds, for example, that is a great example of where, how to get the lats to connect. So even starting with the head down and finding the lat connection, so that reach. So I coach it as reaching up to the ceiling, reach and try and reach all the way across the room as much as you can, so reaching around, wrap the shoulders so from here that pull should want my my head should want to come up with that kind of a pull and then you can introduce the rest of it with the shoulder blades running down and reaching here now this is a big jump from what we were just doing i feel like but if you want to use it to get that lat connection you can and then the other things i've been doing to um help it two other ways one is to sort of start that process, I take a TheraBand or a strap. And if it's a TheraBand, I usually double it over just because that it, um, or even triple it over, just because it doesn't really have to stretch. That's not the point. It's to give support. And you can put it also right at the occiput, so right behind the skull there, at the base of the skull. And then my um, arms, I usually point my elbows not as much out as kind of towards the center of the room. And I wanna do the same thing with the strap that I might potentially do with the hand. I wanna keep the back of the skull in the strap, take a breath in, exhaling, and rib cage drops, head comes along. Here, I can actually start to feel that engagement in my, uh, under here, in my side body that I don't, maybe don't feel when my hands are all, only behind my neck. So I can encourage that and then reverse the motion down. It stays as one piece. So it really teaches that motion as one piece and the trunk rather than just the head coming up by itself. So this band can help me reach long through the back of the neck and come up and also help me find that connection with the underarms here. So that's another way. And then progressing from there, I've been having people bring the legs to tabletop, holding on to the backs of the legs wrapping the shoulders down and then pressing into the hands here. So this press, I can start to engage the side body again. So with that press, I can then engage, drop the rib cage, press the legs so that, and then sit up here and relax this upper part. So I'm wrapping the shoulders down, lengthening the back of the neck. And then I can reverse my way back down trying to keep it as one long piece. 
right? So exhaling, press wrap, shoulders down, and reversing. One more time, just to see if you can feel it. Press wrap, lengthening the back of the neck, and reversing. But the other way you could get that too is TheraBand on the feet, um, wrapping the hands in if that's easier. I don't know which one I find easier, um, but same sort of thing, wrapping the shoulders down, press up, keeping that wrapped position and reversing down. So those are kind of the stepping stones in, in fast forward of how I would get somebody into the right uh, position to get, I think primarily important is to get that rib cage connection to the upper spine. So that would be kind of a stepwise position if your focus was all upper ab curl. Uh, do you guys have anything you want to input on those? Um, I do. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, I was sometimes, and I just want some feedback on this. So sometimes I feel like it's a good cue, um, or at least it really helped me, but I just want to see if it translates to other people, to when you're coming up into the upper ab curl to kind of press your, um, the area between your shoulder blades down to the mat to kind of help engage that area. <laughs> Hands, your, are your hands behind your neck there? Yeah, so hands behind your neck and just like pressing those upper ribs into the mat to help you come up and over your trunk there. That's an interesting idea. Um, I, I don't know. I usually go for the length at the back of the neck, like the feeling of pulling the head off the shoulders rather than pressing into the floor. But mm. I don't know anybody else. Do you, what do you guys think? Does that work for you? I, I'm not sure either, Allegra. I was trying it, but it seems like I go up higher than the shoulder blades, but mm. I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it's, I think, Zaina, you have a, a point there, like connecting the two, like lengthening, and then, you know, um, just another way to think about it, pressing down there. So um, I think it's, I think it's like combining those two together, the lengthening and pressing down mm -hmm. the back and curling over the upper ribs. Yeah, I, t I think I've tended to get away from anything. I talked about that even with the coccyx curl. I've gotten away from cueing anything down into the floor anymore. Um, and maybe that's where I get this uh, and more into like lengthening. It does give you, if you want, and if you feel like you need a fulcrum point, that, that pressing down idea does give you that feeling of a fulcrum. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think I'm trying to get away from the fulcrum idea, although I can cue myself to do it or not, and it seems to feel pretty similar. So mm -hmm. somebody who, who would be your ideal person that you would do that with somebody who can't connect their ribs? Yeah, you know, that's, yeah, thank you for asking. I'm just probing me on this. Somebody connect, can't connect and somebody who pooches instead of, you know, just trying to connect with those upper ribs. So I guess that's why I was saying that cue. Um, especially, you know, on Zoom, it's just like, okay, say it, you know, 20 different ways and just like trying mm -hmm. to figure it out. Because um, I find, you know, it's just like I see people sometimes and they're, they're pooching and it's just I'm like, okay, so how am I going to get them to kind of really hold in there? But I think it starts with just the connecting at the beginning with yeah. the um, pelvic, you know, engaging the pelvic floor on the exhale. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's helpful. It's just, you know, work in progress, okay. it's always queuing is work in progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I have a couple thoughts, um, about that upper, the rib cage engagement, um, and with upper abs. <clears throat> um, so one place that I've been trying to kind of cue that idea of length, um, with a curl is with the hips on the ruler. Um, 
So, where did the roller go? Oh no, I left it outside. <laughs> <laughs> but hips on roller and um, trying to uh, on ball. Um, and trying to cue for not just like this crunching feeling and shortening, but in the dropping of the belly and kind of um, working into the coccyx curl while you're up there. And then also cueing in the ribs, dropping them. I do say dropping them down into the floor here um, and trying to find um, I've been calling it sort of like a long, shallow C curve almost uh, through the spine. And then I, I find like when I kind of cue myself through all of that, it feels like I can even kind of shimmy myself a little bit longer on the floor, leaving the roller where it is. Um, and then that feels nice and long and like sort of narrowing at the same time. Um, the other thing that I've been <laughs> kind of playing with is the ball behind the back. Um, and Allegra, you showed this one for a, an extension stretch um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. several weeks back. Yeah. Um, and I've been kind of playing a little bit with, um, you know, I'll set people up here and, you know, make sure the sacrum is down and um, cue sometimes a little uh, coccyx curl here just to protect the low back. And we'll kind of go into that extension, but then come up into the upper, uh, an upper ab curl, really coming into neutral. Um, so pulling the ribs together and then cueing that long back of neck to find neutral. And then that to me really kind of, um, right, you can feel shortened here, but in that case, you're usually coming up a little bit higher. Um, if you really work for the elongation and the neutral kind of from, you know, waistline up, uh, it to me allows you to really just sit your head back into your hands. And like, I'm, I'm not working really at all through here, except that I'm talking. <laughs> and um, it feels really nice and sort of secure and, and lets you feel the weight of the head there. And at the you do have to hold yourself up here with the ribs and with the upper abs. Um, so I've been doing lots of stuff with that and like, well, to kind of do some leg work there sometimes. Well, that's a great one. That's it. Can I piggyback on that real quick? That was great. Genevieve, what oh. you, you remind me of um, like a common issue that I see with clients that are not like Pilates people necessarily and they're just trying to figure out how to not use the front of the neck and I find when with with cueing I agree of talking about pushing things into the floor when they tuck when they find that kind of um, posterior tilt into that imprint the neck kind of does has a tendency of doing the opposite sometimes and so they'll start here and then they use this to come up out of it so I've been training um, my clients a slow progression of how to notice when they're using the mobilizers versus the stabilizers in their neck. And so I'll show you guys real quick. One of the things that I do here is I have them in the same position, supine on their backs. And then um, what I'll have them do is keep a long neutral pelvis and then do that just slight cervical nod, that slight cervical flexion on the top two vertebrae. And then take a hand onto one side, like a temple. And then keeping that slight nod of the chin, lift your head just an inch off the ground, slightly press into your head, try not to let it move or shift, and then release and doing it on the other side. And that sort of trains people how to keep that gentle nod so that, that when they come up, they're not doing this extension through the cervical spine. And like, if you do that four or five times in a row, I, it feels like a neck workout to me. Um, but that's a really nice way of getting like the multifidus and the rotators and the neck kind of turned on without turning on the SEM. Um, and I feel like doing that and then incorporating the idea of the length of the back of the neck, the contraction along the front side of the body can be really helpful. So just like that little chin tuck, lift like just an inch off, press into your head, feel a little bit of the resistance and then relax out of it. 
doing it again a couple times starts to help you feel what part of the neck does in fact need to work in order to maintain that anatomical line with the thoracic spine without sort of overusing the neck, which I find a lot of people do coming up into flexion from a supine position. I don't know, how does that feel to you guys? It feels really, um... So less off the floor, <laughs> literally if, you're, if, your head, if your head is on the floor, you come up barely off the ground and you're pushing into the side of the head gently trying to maintain that nod and then going back down. Mm -hmm. So you're not coming off the floor very far. It's literally, there's a space for two blueberries stacked on top of one another between the back of your head and the floor. And you're just pressing into the temple next to the, on the side of the skull as you, as you come into that. And oftentimes you'll feel the front of the neck if the chin does start to lift up a bit. And I, I would say that's one of the more common complaints that I get from clients in trying to do any kind of ab curl. Yeah, it seems like doing that, it would be really actually kind of hard to shorten the back of the neck that way. Yeah. You kind of have to, I don't know, what do you get, what does everybody else think? Just, just a quick question on the, the procedure of that. Are you pressing into the hand or the hand is just there to... to the hand is there to apply just a slight amount of pressure. So you're trying to keep your head still, apply a little pressure into the head with the hand without letting the head move anywhere. Mm. And it's this gentle, very gentle cervical flexion and then a press. Oh, okay. Okay. Try that. So... Resisting the, yeah, jamming of the chin. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to differentiate the upper cervical. I, I feel like this gets the upper cervical flexion more. Would you agree, Mary? Is that, um, cause I, unless I'm, right, you're dropping the chin um, you're dropping the chin and then having to come up that tiny bit and press there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So I think, um, I think as a, um, an initiation of the motion to get the chin and head in the right place, that's a great way to initiate because what you're getting is that upper cervical. So those are those, I think you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a, those little rectus capodi muscles for those of you who are fresh on your posterior cervical extensors, you're getting those on stretch by doing that, where a lot of people have them super tight. Um, so that, I think for me, would really initiate that upper ab curl. And then you could finish it with the rib cage once your head's supported. Is that what you do? Yeah, exactly. That's the idea. Get them to support that first so that once it gets yeah. moving, it can be a little bit more following the, right. lead the rib cage mm -hmm. right so it almost be this if we took it down it almost be the like the counter of co coccyx curl the actual coccyx curling before the sacrum right and the sa before the sacrum follows into the whole motion of the pelvic tilt yeah yeah so um we do and pt we do a very similar exercise but we just make them float there we don't let them go anywhere so it's mm -hmm. that same like finger width or blueberry width off the mat and mm -hmm. you just float right right there so or you have them hold this position and get their head on the mat and then slide off the mat but not drop their head oh yeah so that's the same position um i think it's the same as what you're doing just without the lateral stabilizers so that's only working the and then you just slide back into place but that's only the posterior stretch and the anterior neck flexors, high neck flexors versus the lateral stabilizers, whereas the hand on the side actually incorporates those as well. So that's so, great. I love that yeah. sliding off the mat to hold yeah, or the, the table if you make them because then they don't have to lift at all. And they um, they still try and lift and jut the chin forward all the time. <laughs> but that's another take on exactly that. So that's great. Um, 
sorry, I, I missed yeah, that. Go ahead. I was trying to get my complete anatomy up. Um, I so you're saying it's is it kind of like in reference to like on the Cadillac when you do the upper ab curl, like your head is off? Just if you could just repeat that again. Yes. So it's just a little exercise in strengthening the. It'll stretch the posterior capodi muscles, rectus capodi muscles. Um, if you just do exactly what Mary was talking about, but in PT, we just do it instead of having them actually lift at all. We have them position and then we take the table away. Oh, okay. So I didn't actually have to lift or anything. I just have to now stabilize it here. Yeah, and then, yeah. and then what Mary's, the difference is that she's having you come up just a tiny bit and, and then giving you some lateral stabilizer work. So she's going to get those oblique muscles, whereas here you're really just getting the anterior, right? Um, not as much the lateral stabilizers. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point, all of you, yeah. I also wanted to throw in there, um, one of my favorite cues for the rib cage. so wherever that is when you want to engage the kip rib cage, and it, I don't know, so visual to me is I tell them to imagine that you've threaded laces through your ribs, and that you're pulling the laces tight, and that's what gives you that, like the C curve that Genevieve was talking about of the rib cage. Because for me, I can feel that, especially with the hips on the roller, or I can, if I am here and I want the rib cage in, and I tell them, imagine you have shoelaces there, and you pull them tight, and I'm gonna slide off, sorry, pull them tight, then um, it feels like I then get that C curve in the, scooped belly and then the back of the neck nice and long so uh, that's one of the cues that really works in my head but i made it up for because it works with me i don't know if it, it resonates with you guys but maybe something that you could use too to just teach them to knit the ribs um when they're in that when you want them in that c curved rib position yeah does anyone else have something to contribute on that same idea. Okay, so if we're gonna progress on um, to how do we get that neck strong enough, so the rib cage and neck strong enough to not strain, uh, the, one of the my favorite places to take them is into prone or quadruped, right? Then work tummy down or head down. Uh, I, in fact, I was just working with somebody this morning on that. Trying, even just trying to get the head in the right place on all fours is sometimes really challenging for people. So I have them come onto all fours typically. Well, after we have some awareness, right? I think you, they have to have some awareness in order to be able to come onto all fours and start working there. So here, um, if we take the... The position here, I think for me, it becomes so connected to where the shoulders are. But if most people end up in this sort of crunched or head forward position, and when you tell them to lengthen their neck, they just go like this. So I've tried to cue so many different ways and would love your input, but I usually tell them to look down in between the thumbs here so that my eye focus stays there. That's the first thing, so they're not trying to look forward. And then I push the floor away with my shoulders and try and wrap the shoulders. So almost, I've even told people, imagine somebody's foot's in your breastbone and it's just pushing you away from the floor. And then wrap the shoulders down and lengthen out the top of the head. So the top of the head going that way. Right. And that's kind of how I work on this here. And then anything we do from here follows. So you could do your coccyx curl from here where you would drive the tummy up, the tail curls and the head just follows. Instead of pushing from the top, I'm curling from the bottom and then finding my way back to that length and neutral, imagine that head long. And to be honest, I actually find it even better if I take that one leg out, stretching the back of the neck long. So here I find that I get even more out of it here because now I can really feel the length across the body or through the body. So, and really, yeah, really stretching that leg strong. So the knee is strong and the heel is strong and I'm really reaching in opposition. And then I can find that length out the back of the neck more. Yeah. 
So I don't know if you guys feel that or if you have any comments on that. Um, just a quick question on that. Um, I just wanted to make sure I got this right. Um, so when you were saying, so you're on all fours, right? Instead of, you said, I think you said, or this is the way I interpreted it, um, like puffing the chest up, you're more working to get that, um, the coccyx curl and trying not to let the chest kind of cave in with it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I my cats, I, what I don't like is when you get somebody in a cat and they go, and they're pushing their shoulders up like this and their head is, then my neck is all tense again, right? So where I, I've started driving my cat from my tail, which is much like that very first thing I showed you, the pelvic rocking idea. Yeah. So lifting the belly first, letting the belly drive the coccyx curl. This part of me is super relaxed now, that whole upper corner. I don't really have much weight at all on my arms or much tension and I can take that and you'll see that my upper does end up rounding, but here it's free. There's no tension in my neck or shoulders. It's just following my tail. Mm. And, and then I can unroll the tail and let the spine unroll, reach the head long and wrap the shoulders down. And still, I would say I only have 20% of my weight on my hands. That's what it feels like anyway. Okay, yeah. awesome, awesome. Yeah, I just, I was cueing a client and we were just, she was not, being able to get it so I just wanted to double check because I'm like and then I'm like am I even doing am I saying this right so anyway yes thank you yeah 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 you don't have to cue a cat that way you could decide how you wanted it or if somebody is really like ribcage flare like this then then I might actually cue this up first the ribcage up first um but otherwise I find that even in that case if I start with a huge ribcage flare and then tuck my tail, the rib cage has no choice if I keep going, right? To, but to follow mm -hmm. with the rest of my body. And then I don't end up with this push here, this thing, unless that's your goal for some reason, right? And sometimes it might be if you're trying to open across that upper back, you might want them to really press through those arms. But if it's about spinal alignment, and um, I tend to use that whole spine, so use the tail to release because I think Mary mentioned people get way over tense in their neck and we're often trying to unwind that. So I think that's where it comes from. Plus I have this pet peeve about people's head position on all fours. I just hate when you tell them, okay, lengthen your neck. <laughs> like that's not lengthening your neck, that's shortening your neck. Lengthen the back of your neck, pull your neck. Like, <laughs> I've been known to come along and actually pull people's necks, right? Because I want to get that length so badly. So, um, so yeah, I, I tend to go for less work in the neck in order to release it enough to find that stretch. Um, yeah, that was helpful. Yeah, it was just, um, I was just trying to get them to isolate the coccyx curl part with the length, but they were so used to doing it to kind of like illusion of getting length by puffing up in the yeah a lot. So that was, I just, um, yeah, I just wanted to check in about that. So um, yeah, work in progress. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. I add just the cue. I love your, I actually really love the cue of looking between the thumbs and keeping yeah. your hands there. And then I, I, I also cue the pressing into your hands, widening the, the collarbone. Sometimes I'll say, think of the collarbone smiling mm -hmm. so that you keep it broad. You're pressing into the floor to stabilize through the shoulder girdle. And then I'll say, lift the back of your head up between your shoulders. Oh, that's good too. Some of the length that I'll do, because you'll notice when they're on all fours and they're like that, I just go lift the back of the head up between the shoulders, keep that gaze between the thumbs. I usually say keep that gentle nod of the chin, but I'm going to start saying keep your gaze between your thumbs. That's, that's really helpful. Good. Yeah, the, the, all of everything <laughs> that was just said. Um, I also, Sometimes I'll cue the ears, which sounds oh. weird sometimes, but, um, and not everybody always gets it, but for the people who have hard, a hard time differentiating like the back or the front of the neck, um, sometimes I'll say like lift the, the, try to lift your earlobes toward the ceiling. And that kind of gives you the same, mm -hmm. 
I don't, I, I don't know if it's just because like the taking it out of the context of what is my neck doing um, and putting it into something else that like, oh, like there's, you know, it makes you think a little bit differently. I like the earlobes. That's I good. <laughs> That's the other good. thing, go ahead, sorry, Mary, go ahead. I was thinking it, it, that's a good cue because it achieves the gentle cervical flexion and the lift in right. one and it's, and it's maybe not so, because um, some people get really aggressive with their like, I mean, shit, like Jamming, grab yeah. my chin into my throat, yeah. um, which is, you know, better than, you know, the shortened head thing. But um, yeah, some, something about that just creates a little space, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like, I like all of that. The one thing I do want to mention here is that um, I've been at places where people get obsessive about the rib cage in neutral. And I just want to caution that that's not what we're shooting for. People have different size rib cages. And so I think what's really important is before you start an upper ab curls to have an idea of the person that you're working with, what they look like laying down on the mat. So for example, if I were to lay down here, maybe I should take this off so you can see the contrast of colors, but um, if I were to lay down here and really relax, I have, um, my rib cage is pretty wide. It's always been, and then I had three kids, right? So I'm not arching my back. Now I am arching my back, but here I'm in neutral and my rib cage is pretty prominent in that relaxed position. So here I want to be able to have some integrity, but when I put integrity into it without getting out of neutral, that's all I get. And I still have this ridge line of ribs. So that's okay if the spine is neutral and you're trying to support neutral. I would, I would caution you not to always have people imprinting. So that's Allegra, maybe why I got away from the pressing the thoracic spine into the mat as a cue. Mm. Because you don't always want them braced here. Because see then what just happened to my shoulders is they went forward versus here in my neutral, they actually stay relatively open, right? But so you're going to change the dynamic if that's what you're working on in neutral. So that would be the point of caution. If we're talking about upper ab curl, however, it changes, right? Because upper ab curl, I have to pass through that, right? I wanna be in neutral, find the connection, and then continue that in order to come up. But that is when that imprint does work and when the rib cage really coming together, knitting all the way together, pulling downward, all of those things then work if we're talking about head coming up. But if you're gonna keep somebody head down, know that that's going to stay a little bit open and that it's going to vary from person to person. Even, even knitted, mine looks like it's open, but all these are really strongly on right now. And that's really the key and I'm so neutral. So I would say look at where they are and then decide kind of what that next move is. If the next move is upper ab curl, sure, continue cueing that, but maybe not cueing the press down here into trying to get this, unless unless your goal is actually working. And now we do this for a modified, for people who can't lift up their heads, we have them put their hands in knit and release, but it's a moment of knitting and strengthening. It's not a posture that we want to maintain for a series of exercises, for example. Yeah? Good. Any questions on that? Okay, so back to all fours then. Um, so we talked about that head position, that length. This is what stays with you for um, all the planks, right? No matter where we go, this is the posture for the head and neck, for all the planks wrapped down, lengthening and coming back. It would be the posture for all the elephants, except that now my head nods, follows my spine. So it's going to just follow, not drop off and not open up, right? It just follows in that position as well. So. I can keep working any of the positions. My head continues, my neck continues as part of my spine, no matter what angle I put myself in, right? So a lot of people, as soon as the shoulders start pushing more, they end up losing their neck. I call it losing your neck. 
it goes away. There's like no more neck. So releasing into the shoulders, letting them do their work, let the neck stay as an extension of the rest of the spine. And then um, working through that way would be key, I think, for that. Do you guys have any other modifications for how you would teach upper ab curl? If for somebody who's struggling with it, who you want to get there? No, <laughs> I put you all on the spot. No one has any other modifications. The other one that um, I like Genevieve, I really liked yours with the ball. The other way I think to do it is to put your head on the ball sometimes to try and strengthen too. So instead of having them have to hold the head up in that upper ab curl, having them place the neck, the neck itself on the ball can help. And then you could work um, some of these exercises uh, any of the like any of the fives right with the legs going out double leg stretch here and this just allows them to work those little neck flexors right and start developing strength start getting a little more engagement here in the rib cage with the head up and um could be could be okay for some people with osteopenia rather than having them hold and really put weight through the thoracic spine there's still a balance of distribution of weight here so it's not as intense on the spine. So I think this is an okay thing. Even for mild osteoporosis, I think this would be okay because it's supported still, right? So it would be a way to transition them here, keeping relaxed and distributing the weight of the body through the, ver through the vertebra and rather than hinging on one spot. So this is a really nice way to work. Somebody who can get, um, can't really lift their head up. This um, also, the reason that we liked so if you imagine the exercise difference, head down, I can really target my deep abdominals. And sometimes I'll intentionally leave somebody's head down because my focus is here and not the upper body. So people who come in with low back pain, for example, I'm not concerned with their upper quadrant at first. I really just want to find stability in the lower. So keeping the head down just takes that piece out of the puzzle for me. And I can work all my fives modified with um, you know even these big ones with head down, just smaller motion, so that they're supported and I don't have to worry. Um, so those, if that's the focus, then that would be I would say head down and keep it relaxed. But if your focus is strengthening in through the neck and thoracic spine, then it really helps to have the head up a little bit. It's easier to feel this connection into the rib cage if the head is slightly up. So if they're comfortable supported and it's not contraindicated, I would say supported here is the safest way to go if you're gonna bring the head up. This way is more, more um, dangerous for somebody because they'll come up and actually put pressure through. Now I have pressure through just one or two of those thoracic vertebra rather than a dispersed pressure on a wedge or a ball or something that gets me upright a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was that was great. And I actually have um, just a quick question. Um, anyone, please interrupt me if you want to. Uh, they, how far to come up on the upper ab curl? Because what I understand, it's it's you just come sort of to the bottom tips of your shoulder blades. Yeah. 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 So typically, we consider the upper ab curl at the point where my low back is imprinting now and my shoulder blade tips are just off the mat. So the very angle of the scapula is just off and then back down from there. Okay. So a lot of people only get this far. And I think it's, it's um, not far enough actually. And so I've come up with a whole host of ways to try and get them up higher. That's a lot of what the equipment support does is help them get up a little bit higher. But in that case, we, we don't really have that right now so much. <laughs> so using TheraBand, using the hands here, I think really helps. The problem that I'm having is that I have one couple that I do on Zoom twice a week and I can't get them to understand how to connect here because I they both upper ab curl just to here and I, really want to get them in here more. So I've been trying to find 
ways to make them connect. And so I have them do it this way. And because this for me really gets me just a little bit further up and my neck is free. But when I put them here, they just go into their neck. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and I can't, so I've been trying to figure out, I've been playing with, this is like tying people up now. I don't know if you want to try this, but I've been playing with putting a band or a towel, I should double this, behind the neck. And then having them, oh, this is gonna look really bad, hold their legs and then try and come up because then I can have them do both things. But it's kind of, I can't quite get the, it in the right place. I'm saying, you know, anyway, I'm trying to figure out how to get people in that who don't have enough strength. They don't have enough strength. That's the problem. Um, but they, so to hold up their head. They don't have enough strength in the ribcage to really get up enough. So we end up in this really low upper arm curl all the time, which is doing something, but really not doing enough. So anyone have any idea how to get them a little further without straining the neck or with the supported neck also? In that position, is it is it that they're not able to connect through the side body? I think it's a lot connection issue. I think they just, I think they end up fighting themselves. Yeah. And so they end up in that neck strain instead of wrapping and actually, so the, I'm not, I'm pressing my legs to get me there. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that makes it easy to get here. I, I mean, I feel like I could sit here all day, but I, if somebody who doesn't understand this position, I don't know how to get them. If they let their arms go all the way long, which would probably put them in a longer position there, would that work? Because that would pull them up and then they don't have to actually even connect through here. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know if that's a real solution, but maybe to get them to feel it a little bit. Or maybe even feet down. And then I still, f I feel that more in my neck than the other, but maybe that's. Cause it kind of like, it kind of pulls the, the lat. It does the job of the lat almost. It seems. Yeah. Like. Maybe just this piece of it. So the idea with the arms and legs, that sort of like push-pull thing that allows you to stabilize enough to come up higher in the flexion is a pulling the leg, use your arms to pull the legs in, but use your legs to pull the arms out at the same time. That's sort of what's going on, right? That's yeah. Like, and if yeah. they can so, both simultaneously, they can achieve that flexion. Right. And now, I mean, I could take this into my full, you know, all the way up to balance point um, if I wanted to. These, we have a lot of clients here who we don't load inflection into balance point and teasers. So yeah. I've taken that piece and just try to get them into upper ab curl. Um, but yeah, so I'm keeping that tension and creating tension here to allow that to, to hinge me up basically, which is why the neck isn't doing the work is because mm -hmm. arms and legs are. But I think what happens is if the lat doesn't connect, then they end up straining yeah. the neck. And so we've done like thousands of lat pulls. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I get it. I'm just not sure um, if, if anybody had to get there. What if they came up and you had them simultaneously pulling their hands against the legs and pushing the legs into the hands so that nothing really moves? keep them there and then have them take one hand out to the side and then bring it in and then the other hand without anything else changing. I wonder if that might give them a little bit more of a sense into the lateral yeah. side body. Right, like of the lat working. Mm -hmm. The lats and obliques really have to turn on when you release tension on one side and you start to work just unilaterally there. That might yeah. be a way to start bringing in some awareness for themselves of yeah. the side body's uh, effort, the effort side body needs to make in order to help the rest of the body come up. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's a good one. That could work, that could maybe work. I will try it, I'll let you guys know if it works. I'll see them on Friday. <laughs>
<laughs> or maybe hear the band too, or maybe even allowing the band out. I don't know. I was trying to think of a way to support the head and find that connection down. Maybe one hand support. Maybe that's what it is. That might get it. So taking from yours back to then supporting with one hand here and then switching and reaching. Um, I'll play with it. I'll let you know what I come up with. But I like that one hand idea. All right, anyone else have anything to add? This time goes by so fast, I feel like. <laughs> okay, anyone wanna throw out a topic for next session that we'll all remember together? <laughs> no ideas? Anything you wanna well, cover specifically? Okay. I, mean, I like the idea of the diagonals that you talked about earlier today, sorry, before this. Okay, yeah, so we can do diagonals. diagonals. Diagonals is a big topic. All right, so let's do diagonals next week. Bring your best diagonal ideas and um, we can talk about how to get, how to connect there, what those muscles are um, and what we're looking for. That would actually, that would actually fit right in with our rib cage discussion from today, so. Awesome, okay. So I look forward to seeing you guys next week at the same time. Bye. Thanks guys, thank thanks you. for letting me join. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, thank you and yeah. join anytime. Yeah. And if you know anyone else who might wanna join, we'd love to have more. It's just to get people to be able to chat with each other and share ideas and thoughts and learn from each other, so. That's awesome, I love it. Yeah, I'll definitely reach out to other instructors that I know. This is okay. brainstorming. <laughs> Yeah, great. Well, thank you guys so much. Okay. I'll Bye. see you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>